Welcome back. Welcome back. It is uh, hour two of a Money, Money, Money Monday edition of Liquid Lunch on Newsmax TV. I'm John Tobacco. We're coming to you from the Question Tequila Studios right here in downtown Manhattan. Since the show's begun today, the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average has changed from red to green. Things are looking up, and it uh, seems to be a better afternoon than when we started. But the Dow, I think, is in good shape, well above 27,000 at 277. And uh, I'm joined again, of course, in studio by uh, my co-host, managing editor, Frank Morano, joins me. Thank you, and, John. Uh, Frankie, uh, we keep talking about how there's such a divisive time that there's, there's, everyone's divided. And um, it's getting, it seems to be getting worse and worse. And uh, you always find us the best guest. But Peter Bogosian joins us. He's with the Reason Foundation Fellow. And uh, he's also... The, the author of a book, How to Reason with the Left, uh, if that's even possible. <laughs> is uh, Dr. Uh, is, uh, Peter Bogosian with us? Thank you. Appreciate having me on. Thank you. How are you, Peter? Thanks for joining us today. Um, so I you, appreciate it very much. You have written this new book, How to Reason with the Left, um, and it, I'm the looking forward the, to reading it because I've to tried to figure out many ways and it seems like yes, they're the, just completely the, unreasonable. There's a massive problem with reasoning with people on the left. I can't hear them at all, so. No, me neither. Peter, if you can hear us, say something really interesting <laughs> because we can't hear you. You look great, not only very handsome, but very well lit and a great camera shot. Uh, so the audience yes. should at least uh, enjoy the benefit of your commentary. Tell us exactly why you decided to write this book. I decided to write the book because people aren't talking to each other and the fringes on both the left and the right have more or less hijacked conversation and people are sick of it. You know, you have social media attention or a very small group of people, admittedly hyper vocal people, will sit behind their computer and rage against other people. And everybody is viewing everybody else as an existential threat. They hate other people as opposed to f trying to ask, OK, how does someone know that? Why do they believe that? Am, could my beliefs be mistaken? And so no one's really talking to each other. And we've lost a lot of the skills for how to do that as well. Well, uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have my earpiece turned back on, so now I can hear what you're saying. <laughs> and I caught the last bit of it, very insightful. I also caught you on uh, a rival network with Tucker Carlson uh, last week. I thought you were right on the money. And I'm curious about your own experience in academia. We uh, saw just today Donald Trump Jr. and Charlie Kirk, uh, the video of them being heckled off the stage at UCLA. It seems it's more difficult right. than ever to have these conversations on college campuses. As a professor, you're yourself, what have you traditionally done to facilitate conversation among students that may disagree with one another and with faculty? This is a very unpopular opinion, but I bring people with different voices in. I teach an atheism course, and I am an atheist, and I have, I just had a Christian apologist, the head of Ratio Christi, come in and speak to my class, Corey Miller. I believe in intellectual diversity, and I believe that we need to provide students with as much intellectual diversity as possible. But you're absolutely correct when you talked about people being hackling off, off stage. This is a, a very, very serious problem. And it's not just that people are heckled off stage. The problem is that then students see that modeled for them. Like they think that this is the appropriate behavior. I've done events with Christina Hoff Summers and Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying where a tenured faculty members have got up and started screaming at us. So this is a, an enormous problem, and we need to teach ourselves how to talk to people again. Yeah, Peter, this is John. Uh, isn't it odd? Hey, John. Isn't it odd that the left is always preaching about diversity in the midterm elections? They were bragging about how all these women and minorities were elected, and it seems to me that the left is for diversity and tolerance, right up to the point where um, they don't like your point of view. Isn't it dangerous to take actually the opposing side's free speech out of our college campuses? It's worse than dangerous, it's deadly. And the reason is the, the only way to solve problems is to be honest about them. And so no matter what the problem is, you have to start with, I was just thinking about anthropogenic global climate change, and you have to tell people, here are the consequences, here's the best research, here's the best evidence, 
But when people say diversity, it's a, it's a, it's a Trojan horse term. It doesn't mean what you think it means. It means intellectual homogeneity. It means everybody thinking the same thing. So diversity, when folks use it, is the opposite of intellectual diversity. But they've managed to kind of sneak it in that way. So it's like it's almost like a like a trick. They say diversity, which just means what most socialists want. They want to homogenize the whole society so that we all look the same, act the same, make the same amount of money, and uh, all our views are just let us line up and get some bread and cheese. Okay, so this is where it becomes complicated I like and cheese, nuanced. By the way. There's something called intersectionality, where you look at people's identity characteristics, their race, their sexual orientation, and things of that nature. That, that is a, that value, in fact, I just wrote a piece for the American mind about that, about culture war 2.0. So that value has parasitized the consciousness of many on the left. So they're not looking at things like the old left of Noam Chomsky, et cetera, in terms of economic policy and fairness in that sense. They're looking at it in terms of racial fairness. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. that. That's perfectly fine. But that's when they snuggle, uh, smuggle in another term, which is equity. And equity is not equality. So they're, cha- they're bringing in terms to make their ideology um, more palatable to people. It's a form of dishonesty. Peter, I'm curious what repercussions, if any, there have been for you within the academic bubble after publishing your book. Uh, did any of your colleagues view you uh, uh, with a, sort of a sly look when you went to the break room? Did anybody in the administration give you a hard time? Well, my colleagues already have a pathological hatred of me because I published a bunch of fake uh, papers in uh, social justice journals or grievance studies journals about dog rape and fat bodybuilding. And uh, I I translated Hitler's Mein Kampf into a feminist journal and published that. So they're already quite (laughs) livid with me after that point. Uh, Got it. So your response to this particular book has just been more of the same? I know it's, everybody ignores me now. Nobody speaks to, to me. <laughs> well, we're happy to have you. Well, we're happy to have you. I want to well, thank, thank you. you. I want to thank and, you for and, joining and us. Wa- Go ahead. Thanks. I, I just want to comment real quickly. And that's what's interesting about what we see ourselves in this culture. You guys are on the, the sane right. I'm on the sane left. You're inviting me onto your show. We're having a civil conversation. We, we, this is, we need to do more of this. And I'm really appreciative of that. All right. Well, we thank you for coming and joining us. And uh, if you have any developments you want to get out there, I would imagine that your voice is muffled uh, on the left and on the center. Um, But we're here for you. If you want to get the word out on anything, please join us back at any time. Thank you. I appreciate that, guys. Great having you. Thank you, Peter. Peter Bogosian from the Reason Foundation, author of a new book, How to Reason with the Left. Uh, Frankie, I like what he said. He's on the sane left. I like it, too. We're on the sane yeah. right. He doesn't know me, obviously, because I'm, <laughs> I'm far from sane. Um, but, you know, uh, I, as I'm, we'll talk about it a little later, but as you know, I was off on Friday. I'm aware and, of that, uh, yeah. I was lucky enough to be invited down to Mar-a-Lago, the president's home, um, for the book launch of uh, another book party for Donald Trump Jr. and Kimberly Guilfoyle was there. And um, Matt Gates was there. Mm. And Matt Gates gave a really good speech where he was talking about, you know, what's wrong with the left and what's wrong with the right. Um, I think we have a clip of that. This is from um, Mar-a-Lago. No, we don't have a clip of that. Okay. Maybe a little later, an hour or two, we'll have that. But uh, he was talking about how the left, you know, is insane. They just want to fight anything against Trump. And he was saying that many of his colleagues on the right, they don't know how to fight. They're just, you know, following the lead, but they're not actually proactively fighting. And uh, Gates seems to be fighting pretty hard, I think. Uh, he certainly seems like very angry. He's very, very passionate, that's for sure. Yeah, he didn't seem angry when I saw him. Right. I mean, I was a little angry because um, I thought there was going to be a little more food served oh, at, boy. The, uh, at the cocktail party. But it was uh, all desserts. I gave, when I got there, waffle cones, a little mousses, and pastries. It was really I, I, nice. I gave Matt Gates a lot of credit for sticking up uh, for Katie Hill when she was basically forced to resign from Congress after being extorted yeah. from her ex-husband. For being in a thruple. Yeah, exactly. What and is a thruple? I know you said it's it. It's a, a couple time. with three people instead of two. It's a couple with three people. Instead of two. It sounds like an oxymoron. How could you have a couple with no, three people? No, it's a thruple. 
So it's a it's a polyamorous relationship. But see, what you're doing, John, is exactly the problem. You're focusing on kind of the salacious detail. No, it's not. The, I want, I'm just trying to understand what I'm talking about. Half right. the time, I just say things, and you correct me later. I'm, I'm trying to be proactive and not make mistakes. Fair uh, enough. So a throuple is a relationship between three folks. That's my understanding. Okay. Right. So one alter needs. I'm not this. currently in a throuple, but if I ever get <laughs> get in one, I will let you know. And I'm not in a throuple, but I play one on TV. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to, I had to get some. Absolutely. But uh, Eric Bogosian's a professor at a uh, university to be named later. And uh, coming up next, we have a professor from a great university and a great friend of mine and Frank's. Uh, Paul Barquita is going to join us and talk about his new book. And we're going to talk a little further about the climate on these college campuses and how these liberal administrations are trying to mind program our children and... Uh, basically screw up our future, if you ask me. So uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back with Paul Barquita right after this. 